this is Bill Davidow. Uh, I'm Rosemary Romali interviewing him for the uh, Computer History Museum's archives. Uh, Bill, would you first of all introduce yourself and where, what your title responsibilities are today, and then we'll take a step back and talk about it. Well, I, I'm, I'm Bill Davidow, and um, my responsibilities today are grandchildren and philanthropic things, and uh, I, I spend a lot of time with sports and uh, a lot of time with the family. Can you talk a little bit more about which sports and what comprises family? Well, the, the most important thing of family, and uh, the, the, my family is, uh, is my wife and my two daughters and son-in-laws and uh, four grandsons, and then uh, the usual family pets, uh, a dog and a cat, uh, who uh, uh, think they're very important. Uh, and. The second part of the, the second, question. What, what sports are you engaged in? Oh well, we'll talk I, about the philanthropy later. I play uh, a lot of tennis, uh, and um, I, then I love to ski, and I still ski. And then uh, I, when I, I, I windsurf, and uh, then you know a lot of uh, exercise things. I don't know that you want to call that a sport, uh, but whether it's whether it's walking or working out. Let's take a step back and talk about how you got to who you are today. Where were you born, brought up? Who were your parents, um, siblings, that kind of right. thing? Well, I, I was born in Reading, Pennsylvania in 1935, and uh, my family moved to Chicago. Uh, it was either uh, sometime 1937, 1938 ish, and uh, my father moved to Chicago to start a publishing company, and uh, he uh, he had been running a newspaper distributorship in Reading, Pennsylvania, which was a company that brought in newspapers from New York and Philadelphia and distributed them to the newsstands in in Pennsylvania, or in Reading, and um, he was a very creative person and. Um, published a cookbook, uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch cookbook, which uh, he realized there was no cookbook that had Pennsylvania Dutch recipes all in one place. And if he didn't like onions, he left the onions out of the recipes. And there were some complaints about that. And so my grandmother edited the cookbook and it sold so well that he needed a bigger printer. And uh, he was introduced to uh, John Cuneo, who owned Cuneo Press, which was one of the largest printing companies in Chicago, and uh, met him. And uh, in the course of that, uh, Cuneo said, I've always wanted to be a book publisher. And my father, who had never completed high school, said, I'll make you one. And uh, he moved to Chicago to uh, make Cuneo into a book publisher. And he formed a company called Consolidated Book Publishers. And you lived in Chicago up until you went off to college, or did you move move uh, around from there? Well, I, I, I basically lived in Chicago until I was 18, and then went off to college and you know came home in the summers. But uh, did you have siblings? I have a sister who uh, is a couple years older than I am, Anne, and she lives in Boulder, Colorado. And your mother worked uh, in the home only, or did she have a? She was. Uh, uh, she was a full-time mother, and uh, but very active in the Girl Scouts, and uh, she uh, served on the national board of the Girl Scouts of America, and the Girl Scouts were her passion. At what point did you start to show some proclivity for science or science things, engineering me? Well, uh, I was always good at math and was always interested in things like that. I can remember getting a crystal radio set when I was a kid and putting that together and then uh, being very interested in geometry. And I remember spending a lot of time trying to trisect an angle, even though I knew everybody said it was impossible, but that didn't stop me from trying to do it. And then I... Uh, uh, you know, took science in 
in high school, physics and chemistry, and uh, I remember going to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago and just having that general interest. And uh, then when I went off to college, I decided I wanted to be an engineer. So that's... Were there any um, people who influenced that choice, do you think, and your parents, teachers? Well, uh, I, I don't think too many people influence the engineer choice, um, um, but uh, the thing that really set me on the course to uh, getting a PhD was Sputnik, and I was sitting in uh, class in October, I, I want to say October 10th, 1957, but I'm not sure that's quite the right date. It was definitely October of 57. And um, Millet Morgan walked into class and announced that Russia had just uh, launched Sputnik and that it weighed something like, you know, 56 pounds and that our satellite wouldn't be available for another six months and it was only going to weigh eight pounds. And he explained the difference in the rocket power required to launch a 56-pound satellite as, a composed, as compared to an eight-pound satellite and how far we were behind. And I just decided that anybody who had any scientific ability at all owed it to the country to learn how to use it and uh, save the country uh, as a result of that. And so, so he was a college professor? He was a college professor. Let's take a step back. So you, when you left, when you finished high school, you went off to go to? Dartmouth. Dartmouth. And how did you choose Dartmouth, or how did they choose you, or some combination? Well, I, I applied to, where? I applied to Dartmouth, Yale, and Amherst, and the Colorado School of Mines. And um, I uh, got into all of them, and then I had friends who went to Dartmouth, and I wanted to learn how to ski. And uh, so it was about that intellectual a choice. Uh, that uh, it was not a particularly rational decision. But I, I also loved the out of doors and Dartmouth was not in a city and so that was great too. And you were at Dartmouth for all four years, undergraduate? And then I got a master's degree from Dartmouth. A master's degree in? In, in en electrical engineering. Okay. And then you went from there to Caltech. Caltech. And I, I subsequently got a master's degree at Caltech, and then I went up to Stanford. And so got you a, have two master's degrees. That's correct. And then I got a PhD from, um, from uh, Stanford. How did you migrate from Dartmouth to Caltech to Stanford? What kind of were the decision points? Well, um, I decided that I should go to the toughest graduate school in the United States if I was going to save it. And um, that was what brought me to Caltech. And then uh, I, I, I was accepted back in the PhD program, but there were 14, 12 to 14 of us accepted back in the PhD program, and they were gener graduating about six PhDs a year. And I went to talk to the head of the electrical engineering department, and I said, where in the pecking order do I stand? And he said, you're somewhere between 12 and 14. And I felt the odds weren't particularly good that I was going to be able to uh, get a PhD from Caltech or would get a PhD from Caltech. And so uh, I applied elsewhere. And I also, by that time, I had a two years of graduate school and really uh, came to realize that probably I was not that interested in doing research and so I just wanted to get a PhD and get through with it. Get out. Get out, right. <coughs> what did you write your thesis on? On logic design for computers. When did computers come into your mm -hmm. life, or when did you begin well, I, to I, know about them? I, it, well, I obviously uh, knew about them in the night you know, when I was at Dartmouth, and then I can remember I had a very good friend of mine, Bob Rosen from high school, who was very interested in digital computers, and I went to Caltech, and Caltech uh, 
had one of the best analog computation programs uh, around, and I used to argue with people, I used to argue with Ben about how important analog computing was, and he would say, oh, digital computing is really the thing. And the, a lot of the really complicated problems that people had to solve, like um, there was a problem called the flutter problem, which... I'm th sorry, the what problem? The flutter. Yeah, like the flutter? Like, yeah. And, uh, it, what happens is that in airplanes, and it, it's the same reason why the Tacoma Narrows Bridge fell down, but you get a harmonic vibration in the wings of airplanes, and um, airplane wings would fall off if uh, they weren't designed properly, and the analog computers were pretty good at simulating that phenomenon, and Caltech was doing a lot of work in that area at that time, but they also had um, digital computers. They had a Burroughs 205 and uh, an LGP-30. And when I was there, uh, you, you couldn't get credit for taking a course in computer programming or anything like that at that time because it wasn't an academic discipline. But I, I remember studying all the logic equations in the LGP-30 and it was designed by a fellow named Stan Frankel, who spent some time at Caltech. And so I knew everything that went on in the LGP-30. It, it's hard to believe it had a 4,000 word magnetic storage, uh, which were, I, I, I think, 16-bit uh, words. And it had either eight or 16 instructions. I think it had 16 instructions. and um, and. It had uh, 14 flip-flops in it, and which were vacuum tubes, and I think 754 diodes, and that was the machine. And it worked, and I learned how to program it. And then um, I took a course in numerical analysis uh, at Caltech from a professor, Joel Franklin, and uh, Joel really understood a lot about computation, and. Um, he, um, um, he used to talk to us about all the problems with computing these things numerically. And uh, we programmed um, the uh, Burroughs 205 at that time to do some of these things. And um, that was how I learned initially to program, but I mean, that was very primitive programming. Earlier you were talking about how difficult it was to do some of these things. Can you talk about that in a little more detail? Well, I mean, it was just that, you know, at that time, uh, we were programming pretty much in machine language, which meant, I mean, you wrote down, uh, there, there was very little machine help for programming, so it was extremely tedious. The interesting thing, is that the IEEE floating point standards that are used in microprocessors today were directly a result of uh, um, my uh, taking a numerical analysis class from Joel Franklin. And I, a number of years later, like 30 or 40 years after that happened, went back and told him that the uh, IEEE floating point standards, uh, which are used in all computers today, um, were a result of taking that course. Can you uh, explain a little bit more how that came about, or what the connection between the two is? Well, uh, the, the problem that he pointed out was that in lots of numerical calculations, <coughs> you had something called round-off error, and where um, <coughs> you multiply two numbers together, you multiply two 10-digit numbers together, and you get a 20-digit number, and then if you multiply two 20-digit numbers, you get a, you know, a 40-digit number. And at some point, the number gets too long for the computer to hold on to all the digits, so you approximate in the last digit. And that approximation is an approximation, and in certain calculations, it sort of seeps its way back through and can cause the whole calculation to fall apart. And when I came to Intel, I, I realized that uh, 
uh, we were going to put microprocessors in a lot of people's hands and that there was a very real possibility that uh, you know, people would be computing with them and not understand this and get the wrong answers. And <coughs> so uh, I, I decided that <coughs> we should come up with algorithms that were reliable, that people could use, and that those algorithms, whether you had a hardware-assisted um, a, a piece of silicon that did the computation, or whether you, you were using a software routine, should produce the identical result. And um, so when I came to Intel, we hired somebody, I forget, his first name was John, and I'll think of his last name, to work on that problem. And there was a fellow named Kahan at Berkeley who was very interested in the problem. He used to play around with calculators <coughs> and you know, he would multiply and divide and show that calculators would give vastly different results based on their numerical algorithms. <coughs> and he worked with us and then ultimately um, that became the, uh, those algorithms became the, the basis for, I guess it was the 387 floating point chip 8387, I think that was the number of it. And then um, <coughs> that algorithm ultimately worked its way in and became a, uh, a uh, IEEE standard for computation. It was ironic that, uh, oh gosh, after I left Intel, uh, this was, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, Intel ran into the floating point computation problem. And I was thinking about that. <laughs> and uh, that uh, I, I uh, uh, and kept telling people, uh, the initial response was that it wasn't a problem. And I, I had some communication with them saying, hey, uh, don't tell people it's only one error in 10 billion. It, 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 if you have an error, it's a problem. And did you have? Can you take any credit for convincing Dr. Grove to change his mind on that? Uh, I, I, I think I think Andy, uh, if I remember this correctly, uh, uh, would would tell you that I, uh, you know, I, I think I I gave him some advice that he listened to which turned out to be good advice. Well, let, me, let me go back and ask you to put dates on your uh, degrees, your undergraduate, your two master's degrees, and your well, um, <coughs> PhD. It, it, I, I, 57 for my bachelor's uh, from Dartmouth, 58 for my master's from Dartmouth. Then I went to Caltech, and actually I left there, and didn't have a master's degree, but they subsequently gave me one because they thought that I had met all the requirements. <coughs> and then I got my PhD from Stanford in 61. So for at 61, or not at 61, in 1961, um, you were ready to get a real job, what I call a real job, mm -hmm. uh, in the industry somewhere. How did you go about figuring out where you would want to go? Well, uh, <coughs> I liked the idea of living in the Bay Area, and uh, IBM was here. There was not much computer activity. Now, were you married there. at this point? I got married in 65. And, um, and uh, General Electric had an R&D lab because General Electric had developed IRMA, which was the first transistorized digital computer uh, in the Bay Area. And then their computer department had become established in Phoenix. And I believe that's where IRMA was initially manufactured. And <coughs> uh, Joe Weizenbaum, who uh, was uh, running uh, uh, part of the area, and um, there was a fellow who worked with him, and I, I think I probably met Don Offenkamp at, at, uh, at Stanford, and anyhow, I got introduced, and I, I went to do computer research at the computer research lab they had here at the time. They being GE. GE, yes. Okay, and so your first position was an entry-level engineering research. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did did what what about GE attracted you besides its Bay Area location, or was that? Well, I I, I, I mean I I don't think it was a particularly I, it, uh, rational choice. I had I had two opportunities. 
uh, one would have been, I, I, I don't know whether I got an offer from IBM. I may have accepted the GE offer, but Mort Astrahan was doing the Sabre system for IBM down in San Jose. And uh, I, I had talked with Mort, and uh, for some reason I picked GE. I don't. You know, I think of you as being a, ultimately a very logical person, and I'm finding out that you have these two kind of irrational decisions in your background. Well, maybe it was rational at the time. I just don't, uh, I, I, I don't remember the great rationale. Um, so did they provide some training, or who did you work with in a, within a group? Talk a little bit about what that job well, was. Well, there, there was a, there was a uh, a, a, a group there, and uh, I was just, I was, I went there and I was doing research, and then there was a group there that was trying to design advanced peripheral equipment, and uh, GE. What would, it, I'm sorry, what, what would advanced peripheral equipment be? Would it be I tape was, drives and? Uh, no, this, this happened to be, they, they were, were, were working on you know, things that went around the computer. And in one case, GE was one of the leading suppliers of check sorting equipment that read the magnetic ink on the bottoms of checks. And uh, it turns out IBM came up with a much better, more reliable reader. And um, so uh, I took on a project of trying to improve the reliability of the GE check reader. And uh, that was one of the things that that, that I worked on while I was at GE. And we came up with a, a scheme for uh, doing that. And uh, then uh, uh, I, uh, GE decided they were gonna close down the lab and move us all to Phoenix. And I didn't think that was a very good idea. And I had a friend of mine from Stanford who was working at Hewlett Packard, and Hewlett Packard had bought this small computer company um, in Michigan, and w decided that they were going to get into the computer business. And um, so uh, Kay Magleby was running the Hewlett Packard engineering effort, and I went over there to uh, to work in that engineering effort. When. Um when you were at GE, did you have any sense at all that the research you were doing, the work you were doing, was connected to customers, or were you pretty isolated from a customer interface? Well, I, I think reasonably isolated, reasonably isolated. I mean, you know, I used to spend a lot of time in Phoenix, and I had friends down there, and we, uh, uh, I mean, it, it was a, it was a, I learned a lot about computers when I was at GE. And also one of the things I learned was that IBM had a research budget that was larger than GE's sales. And I decided that that was probably a losing battle. And, uh, uh, but GE was working on uh, some very, very advanced designs that, uh, uh, you know, and one of them failed. <laughs> it was just too complicated. And there was another division in GE that had a had a a different design. It was not. It was one of the defense divisions. I think it was. I think it was being run by John Weil, and uh, the computer department took over that design, and uh, that became the GE six thousand or something, which was the computer that they ended up selling. You said you learned a lot about computers at GE. Um, kind of, what did the Bill Davidow that entered GE? How did he change when he left GE? What would, what were the key things that you took away with you that you built on going forward? Well, I, I just I, I learned a lot about digital computer architecture and how. Uh, I, I, I was trying to think of the other fellow that was there, John, uh, somebody who. who uh, went on to become a professor at, at some place in Texas. Let's say John Mc... I, what was his name? Anyhow, I'll, I'll, I'll once again. And, you know, we talk about these things, and, and I, 
I thought I really understood how a computer should be architected, and uh, so uh, and I was all excited about going to work with Hewlett Packard, which was designing a new computer, and um, the uh, and I thought I could bring some of that with me. What year did you go to HP? I think it was probably 1966. Okay. And what was your first assignment there? Well, I was I was working on the computer, and it was a very strange thing. The, the computer architecture was just horrible. It was just horrible. What was horrible about it? What made it horrible? Well, it, it, it the, the guy who was heading, the intellectual leader of that program was a fellow named John Cadella, and uh, there was somebody else named Gene Stinson there who was a very good logic designer. And John had uh, these ideas about the way the uh, opcodes of the computer should be designed, and they were all wrong, in my opinion. And Roy Clay, who you probably ought to interview sometime, um, um, was running the software group, and he ultimately revolted because he said the computer was going to be impossible to program, and he he got that changed, and uh, and I became friendly with the people in marketing and decided that I had always been interested in marketing and reading a lot about marketing and I had sort of self-educated myself on marketing and I decided I wanted to go to work in marketing so that was good use of my PhD and but they had nobody in marketing who understood anything about computers so I went out to do marketing at, at, at Hewlett Packard. And how did HP define marketing? Was it product marketing? Was it in this case it was product marketing okay. that so I was doing? So you were working with the customers to define the product. Well, I, this involved more promoting and learning how to and educating the field and what have you. And the first HP computer was the twenty one sixteen, and it, um, it it was designed in such a way that the HP instruments plugged into it, which made it great for use with instrumentation, but the computer was the slowest, the heaviest, the largest, and the most expensive mini computer available at the time for what it did. And uh, the challenge was to figure out how to sell it. And uh, so uh, that was something that I became involved in. And how did you figure out how to sell it? Well, I learned I think a lot about marketing at HP, and uh, you know, HP was run by Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, and I think it was, and I, I don't know that much about the current HP, but at that time, uh, probably one of the finest com companies in the United States. I mean, it was, it was, uh, a technology leader. It had, you know, tremendously loyal customers. It was very responsible and took very good care of their customers. They had, you know, almost a, they had a leadership. I'm inclined to say a monopolistic position in the instrumentation market, the electronic instrumentation market. And you know, they they had this wonderful corporate philosophy about taking care of customers and what have you. And here uh, I was with this division that had designed what was uh, arguably one of the worst computers on the market. And, uh, and you know, it, it was a, a philosophical uh, crisis for me, you know, like uh, here I am, um, and you know, do you look a customer in the eye and you say that this is the worst computer in the market? Don't buy it. Uh, or do you say, I will create a customer experience for you that will take a computer that isn't particularly good, but 
because I'm working for a great company, I can create a better customer experience for you than if you buy this computer from somebody else because even though the computer isn't so hot, you know, I'll provide you with service and support. If you have to use an HP instrument, it all plugs in and I've got all these services that go along with it and I can provide you with good software and things like this. And if this sounds a little bit like the 8086 at Intel, uh, it is. And then I remember going down to the Los Angeles sales office and, you know, going to the field was not a pleasant experience because I was trying to get them to sell this computer that every time they presented it against the competitive machine, they got their heads kicked in. And I can remember Phil Scalzo down there saying at the office, he said, every salesman comes back to the office at the end of the day and tells people about something good that happened when they were trying to sell the computer. And, and so I learned a lot from that experience. And ultimately, um, you know, HP became successful in the computer business. And I suppose if we had not made the 2116 succeed, uh, HP might not be there. So I, I learned a, an important lesson that if you're working for a great company that's committed to the customer, uh, you can take a product that maybe isn't technologically as superior, but turn it in to the best thing for the customer to buy. Were you aware of uh, Ted Levitt's at Harvard's thinking about total product at that point? About what hope? No, I was not aware of that. I, 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 I don't know where I learned about Ted Levitt. Probably Regis? I don't, I don't know. But uh, anyhow, I, I somehow learned about Ted Levitt. And, uh, later, though. Later. Yeah. Right. Because this is a, certainly a parallel concept. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. But I, uh, I mean, I think he articulated it very well. And uh, uh, but it, it, I don't think that. Uh, uh, I mean, I, th I think his articulation was really good. I mean, the idea was something that people had been using for a long time. Which is not unusual in, within innovation, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to HP. So uh, you were part of a, a marketing team? Were you then, a marketing manager? Uh, what? Well then, uh, you know, I was running computer marketing and then Tom Perkins came along and he, he became the division head and I ran marketing for him and then we formed a computer group and I I became the head of marketing for the computer group but that was sort of a staff job and I was trying to the, the calculator division was involved in it and the computer division was involved in it and I was trying to coordinate these things and uh, that was not a great job because the divisions all were very independently minded and they didn't need somebody on the corporate staff uh, running around working with them. So, uh, And how long were you at HP altogether? About four years. About four years. Okay. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to leave HP and go someplace else? Well, um, I, I um, a lightning bolt may strike me from uh, above, but I invented the microprocessor when I was at HP. I've always said I was one of the 10,000 people who invented the microprocessor. And I remember running into uh, uh, Bob Noyce and Ted Hoff at a full joint computer conference in Las Vegas and talking to them about my ideas and that they were very interested. And I even made a presentation to the, all, the Intel board about microprocessors. Uh, While you were still at HP or? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, and I went and talked with them. I remember Tom Perkins 
warning me about this, that I could run into problems and what have you. Because and you were working at HP and talking to Intel. Yeah, but Intel was, I mean, it, in, I mean, it was Bob Noyce and it was something. So, um, and um, then uh, I somehow, um, um, I'm trying to get all the chronology straight, but I, I, you know, I had met Bob and I had met Vic Greenwich uh, when they were both at Fairchild, and somehow, um, uh, I don't know how it all relates, but anyhow, somebody from Signetics approached me about, they had, were setting up a memory company, and this was, would have been probably 1970-ish. And I, I said, well, gee, it would be fun to go over there and take the memories and develop a microprocessor. And uh, I, there was a, a fellow at GE named Glenn Oliver that I hired to come to work. And he came to work and uh, we developed a microprocessor at Signetics Memory Systems that was a bipolar microprocessor but aimed at doing logic replacement. And um, we uh, uh, developed design aids that would go with it. These design aids were like precursors to the development systems? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm getting ahead of your story. No, I mean, <laughs> well, it, but it, what we did is we developed a ROM simulator, a read-only memory simulator that you could plug in and programming tools so you could program the, uh, the microprocessor and then uh, you could plug it into a system and uh, you could enter the, enter the uh, data into this read-only memory simulator and execute programs. It was sort of our answer to the EEPROM. And I, I don't know whether EEPROMs, EEPROMs had to have been available or were just becoming available at that time. But this for bipolar did something very similar to the EEPROM for MOS. And uh, so we had, had all of these tools and uh, I, we, uh, I, I was running the marketing for it, but I was sort of the, the intellectual leader of the idea. Glenn Oliver were, were, were the brains. And the, the company ran into problems because we couldn't fab anything in the fab area. I mean, it was just. Were uh, you a, you know, sharing the Signetics name certainly, but were you were using their fab or? We had our own fab. You had your own fab. But but I mean, owned by Corning. It was owned by Corning, but uh, but I mean, it, it was just it was just a, a, a manufacturing disaster, mm -hmm. and so um, um, I uh, and Corning then put in a new manager, and he and I didn't get along at all, and uh, I. Uh, I went in and quit, and I think I went in and quit about two hours before he was going to fire me, and I walked back to my office, and the phone rang, and Ed Gelbach was on the phone saying, I'd like to talk to you about coming to work at Intel, and that was in 1973. And uh, so uh, I started talking with Ed, and that was how I ended up at Intel. Let's loop back, because I think I interrupted you in the microprocessor invention story. Yeah. and jump to the development system. You want to wrap, be a little more complete about that? Well, no, I mean, it was just that, that I, I think that, that uh, there were a number of people who had um, similar ideas about uh, uh, building these types of computing devices and, and uh, Intel 
you know, really got to the market first with it. Uh, but, uh, and I, I think it's great that they did, but it, it, it's, always, it's always fascinated me. And certainly, when I was at Intel, I promoted the idea that Intel were, were the inventors of the microprocessor. But it was always fascinating to me because, uh, you know, I don't consider myself to be the world's greatest technologist, but if I was, came up with the idea and I was working on it, I had to assume that there were 50 other people who were doing the same thing. And uh, uh, I think it's great that, that uh, it, you know, Intel uh, took the credit. Took the credit, sure. Um, one more loop back and then we'll move on to Intel. What was the bone of contention between you and your manager at Signetics Memory System? Do you even remember? No. <laughs> it just was not a relationship made in heaven? It was not a relationship <laughs> made in heaven. Okay, okay. Let's talk about Intel. You know, 1973, can, it's, you know, today it's hard to think back what Intel must have been in 1973. Can you describe the company, who were the leaders, um, kind of the, well, what was, I mean, what was, was going on? Where, where did they fit in in the semiconductor universe at that po point in I, time? Well, I, I, thought, I thought Noyce was running the company when I, and uh, you know, I knew Bob, and I knew Gordon, and I think Bob gave uh, Ed Gelbach my name, and I know that there was some debate as to whether I was too old to be hired because I was 38, and, uh, and I, I know that because um, my parents had a friend named Sam Rosenthal who was on the board of Grinnell with Bob Noyce, and he told my parents that. And um, and uh, and how old was Bob at that point? Well, oof. if I was 38, Bob was probably five years older than I was, so he was 43 or 44. So a really old man. Yeah. Well, 73, 70. I, I I don't know how old Bob was, but I don't I don't think he's. I mean, Bob. That's it. That seems about right to me. Maybe maybe a little older than that, but not much, not much. And and so, what about what what was Ed's role at that point in time? He and was running was he was running sales and marketing, and the microprocessor marketing and the development system activity. We had something called the intellect, and I got there and I looked at that box and. I, I was seriously concerned that somebody was going to electrocute themselves if they used that box. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was just, the, the, the development tools that Intel had were, you know, extremely primitive, extremely primitive. And, um, but, you know, they had a, they had a board that Ted Hoff had designed for prototyping the four, with the 4004. And um, they had, uh, uh, they had these blue boxes called uh, that you, you used for the 8008 and the 8080, but all they were were they were boxes that you could develop software on. They they didn't they, they didn't let you really get involved in the design at all. And so uh, I had this idea that. We how many? I'm sorry. How many employees did Intel have at that point? Do you think? We, well, Intel finished the year at about 60 million, and I don't know how many employees there were. A little over 60 million, 66 million, I think. And they were. Was the company organized by function still, or had they started going to business units? It was by function. By function. Okay. Yeah. Now go ahead. I'm sorry. And Bill. so, I. I, I knew a lot about ROM simulators at that time, read-only memory simulators, and the idea was you could, you know, plug these things in and change the programs and what have you. And um, so uh, I began talking about doing that kind of thing at Intel, and uh, uh, we had hired Terry Opendyke, and he thought the idea, he was running software, and he thought the idea was just stupid. And the idea of of, a, of of this kind of 
hardware simulation tool, and I felt that that was what engineers would want. And Hap Walker was working in the uh, in the uh, microcomputer area, and so uh, I could either talk with Hap or convinced Hap or Hap convinced me, but anyhow, Hap came up with a much better way of doing this, and he became the engineer on the project, and that's what led to the development system uh, effort, and, uh, and then we began to once again create all of this support that went around the Intel microcomputer, and so we had, you know, software programming languages. Gary Kildall had done PLM, and we had assemblers, and we had these boxes, and we had all of these tools that made it easier for the engineer to uh, um, debug his designs. And then I hired somebody from who I had worked with. I believe at both GE and Hewlett Packard named John Pavone to come in and run customer training. And so we, you know, we set up these customer training programs where we would go out and educate customers on how to use Intel microprocessors. So we were... Um, and you're still the marketing manager for the microprocessor at this point, reporting yeah. to Gelback? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, we... we, we uh, created, uh, you know, something like a whole product at that time. Uh, I mean, trying to provide a comprehensive set of solutions to the customer. Make it easier for them to be able to design in. That's right. Yeah, okay. Um, where did Intel fit in the semiconductor universe at that point in time? I mean, there was Motorola, uh, the U.S. semiconductor yeah. universe. Well, uh, we were the leaders in semiconductor memories, and uh, the microprocessor thing, I remember the arguments, uh, because Ed decided, or I think from an accounting point of view, we got credit for the profits on the memory sales that went with the microprocessors. But the microprocessors themselves were uh, uh, not a very profitable device. In the case of the 4004, I think we figured out we were spending more money on printing the manuals than it cost to manufacture the microprocessors. and. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, it was kind of like, you know, it was everybody around the company was, we're a memory company and, you know, the microprocessors are kind of there. And uh, uh, it was not uh, a, uh, um, a prime focus of the company, I would say. Or let me put it this way. Uh, from a PR point of view, there was a lot of enthusiasm about it, but from an internal inside the company, all the money was being made on the memory, so there was, you know, tension there. Who who were the champions of the memory business and who was who were the champions of the microprocessor business? Well, um, I mean I, I think that you had the marketing group that I was running that were obviously the champions of it, and there was Ted Hoff and Federico and uh, Shima, who uh, you know were all very enthused about it. And I think what, I, about, I, what about Les? The well, I, I I I think Les was enthused about it, but you know I I think I think Les got more and more enthused about it over time, but. You know, all these guys initially were memory guys, and I mean, Les might, have you interviewed Les? He might tell you something different, so, uh, did he? No, I haven't. I've obviously had conversations with him over the years, and I actually had a conversation with him in preparation for this, but he, we did not discuss this particular aspect. Yeah, but I, but, I mean, I, Les got ultimately very enthused about it. I mean, you know, there are all these stories about how, how, um, how when, Intel developed a microprocessor. The marketing guys weren't going to 
announce it and bring it to the market. And Ted Hoff said, if you won't, I will. And, you know, it was, it, it was, um, and I was one of the first computer guys to go to work at Intel. And I'm trying to think whether Optendijk was there. I think Optendijk may have been there before I got there. But there were very few people who understood anything about computers. And, and it, it was, and we had a hard time recruiting anybody who understood anything about computers because these, these microcomputers were just Mickey Mouse little devices that didn't do anything. And um, they weren't really used for computation. They were used for logic replacement. And so, um, you know, today they're used as computers, but at that time, uh, you know, they went inside cash registers. I guess that was a computer application. Or they went inside a stoplight, which was more a logic application. So. Okay. Um, so. Went in, into milking machines. Milking machines. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yes. I had never heard that story. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was uh, one of the big, big wins. And, and uh, I, one of the big, uh, I had run this ad. Uh, Regis had come up with this ad. Regis McKenna, of, um, of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, and that had the chicken in it. And the ad was which came first, the chicken or the egg, and something like this. And you know, I wasn't too th enthusiastic about the ad, but it had this big chicken in it. We ran it, and, and the engineers went absolutely crazy. They thought it was, you know, and so. The marketing guys were. <laughs> and the marketing it. guys, I, I don't know, I probably should have not let the ad been run, but the executive staff at Intel, and this is a sexist story for you, Rosemary, they just, they just sided with the engineers. So they were going to approve all microprocessor ads from there on out. And so I had somebody do a storyboard uh, with an ad with a cow in it because the, the uh, microprocessor was in the milking machine. Do you know what's happening? I have a sense of where this is going. So the headline on the ad said, Intel sucks hind tit. <laughs> and Gordon Moore he said, teat, T-E-A-T. <laughs> and so, so after that, people decided that maybe they didn't need to review all the ads. So that should go down in history. I, right? I think it should. I, I thought you were going to tell me you also had a very attractive young woman go in and present the storyboard. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's get back on track. Let's talk well, about was that on track? <laughs> talking about executive staff, you were part of a fairly I iconic executive staff team. Yes. Um, how did they work to get, let's, let's talk about who was on that executive staff. It was Grove, Moore, Noyce, uh, Gelbach, you, House, was he on yet? No. Videz. No. Videz, Carson, Karsten. and uh, Larry Hootnick. Larry Hootnick. Okay, that's a bunch of pretty A type of folks. Mm -hmm. um, so talk about how that group act, interacted. Well, I, 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 think, I think we, we uh, interacted pretty well. I remember one of the, <laughs> we were in one meeting, and Andy looked up and said, has anyone in this room ever run a $300 million company? And everybody looked around and shook their heads, and we were a $300 million company at that time. And, uh, but I, I think we worked pretty well together. It wasn't that there weren't some tensions, so. Um, what about Intel culture? Before we go jump into the microcomputer group uh, responsibility, but what about the Intel culture? How, wh where was, what stage was it at? That's not well, good I, English. Well, I think, I think the Intel culture was pretty well formed at that time. and. Uh, I, I probably fit less well in that Intel culture than anyone on the executive staff other than, I mean, I was, if there was somebody who didn't fit it. Uh, Why uh, would you say that? What? Well, I, I never believed very much in constructive confrontation and uh, I, 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 it, it worked well for some people. It didn't work particularly well for me and I think uh, uh, but, uh, you know, so 
that was something I never felt completely comfortable with. Um, let's talk a little bit about the elements of Intel culture and how they worked in favor of the company and helped move the company forward at the pace at which it moved forward ultimately. Well, you know, and, Andy, um, I think, taught a lot of us how to manage. <laughs> and he put in place great mechanisms for keeping things coordinated. And um, I, I think that, um, I mean, whether it were, was the MOMARs where you, you really learned what was going on uh, it, Momar stood for monthly operation management reviews, and you, you know, one minute the marketing guys would present, and the next minute the engineering, next month the engineering guys would present, and you would learn about what was going on around you, and that was like going to business school in many respects, and it, it kept things coordinated, and then, you know, there was the strategic planning processes we put in place, so I think I think Andy put in place, and Andy was very com committed to getting everybody trained, so Andy put great processes in place. And, uh, and he was very organized and great at following up, and, uh, uh, and I, I always said that, that Intel was the best managed company I ever worked for, and Hewlett Packard was the best led company I ever worked for. I mean, uh, uh, it, it, there was a difference um, uh, in, uh, you know, like Dave Packard could uh, make a comment, and this was before email, in a meeting, and everybody in the company would know about it in, in 20 minutes, and it, I'm sure it took longer than that. But um, uh, he, you know, he, he, he sort of got everybody you know, following his lead, and I think Intel drove everybody to follow the, the lead. So it was a little, it was different. How was Andy to work for? Well, I think Andy was fine to work for, um, you know, and... Uh, as long I mean, as you were willing to put up with constructive confrontation. Well, I mean, I, I don't think Andy was the most comfortable person I ever worked for, and I, you know, I one time had a discussion with Andy. I said, look at Andy, you don't have to yell at me. All you have to do is tell me what you want done. And, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, I'll do it. And I, uh, and I thought that was a pretty good meeting, uh, but uh, so. So you are still now, you're still leading marketing under Galback or mi yep. microprocessor, mi microcomputer yep. marketing under yep. Galback. So what was your next responsibility? Well, somehow Les and I, Andy, um, you know, wanted to put Les and myself in a box where, you know, because we had well, the development system thing was becoming a pretty big business. You might want to explain what it, when you say in a box, because that was something well, there, fairly there uniquely there were, He wanted two of us running the operation. And uh, I, I, I think Andy, well, I know Andy had a great deal of respect for me as a marketing person and not much respect for me as an operations manager. It was the way it went. And um, so... Uh, uh, he decided that putting Les and I together to run this would be a, a good thing, and so Les had the uh, the uh, engineering, and Keith Thompson was running the uh, factory for us, and uh, that man manufactured the development systems, or I think Keith was, but anyhow, the the two of us were together there, and. That worked for a while, and then I, I just decided that I wanted to go run the development system business. So I took the development systems, and that became a, a separate division. And you know, so we, you and Les were no longer two in a box by the time you're running development system, or are you? I don't remember. Okay. I, 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 I don't remember quite how that all worked out. But anyhow, I took the development system thing, and and um, no, I less. I I don't think less was involved in that. 
because, you know, I, we, I moved Jim Lally up to Oregon, and we started the, uh, we started selling the boards from the boxes as individual systems, so we started the board business. And that was the business that I wanted to be responsible for. And um, that grew to be a hundred million dollar a year business or something that size. And, you know, the development systems, we were, ended up selling them for $25,000 a piece. I mean, they were, and, uh, you know, that was, uh, uh, it was a great business. Well, as I call, recall, didn't uh, Intel use that as a way of predicting uh, processor sales? Well, the argument that I, I gave people was you sell a development system and then after a year you would sell so many dollars in microprocessors. So as to whether, I mean, this was more a, you know, a, a putting a finger in the air. But um, I, uh, I, uh, anyhow, and we were going to use the boards sort of in the same way. And it was a, it, 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 it turned out that ultimately the development system business got done in by the PC. But I guess that came, came we needed a PC before that was going to happen. Because people began to take the PCs and design their own in-circuit emulators to go with them. And then a $25,000 development system was suddenly worth $10,000. And it was not as great a business. And we should have done the same thing, but that's a different, a different story. Are you implying that Intel could have been the PC? You know, they had a PC and didn't. Oh, we definitely we had a PC, and actually we had. Uh, ISIS was the operating system that we were running, and that was every bit as good as MS DOS, and uh, what we should have done is, is is sold it to IBM or given it to IBM. And uh, we try to protect it as being a proprietary thing. And I remember Optendike was the greatest proponent about that. I bought into that idea because we were going to undermine the development system business if, um, if we put this the in the public domain. Had we put it in the public domain, um, it, it m might have obviated the need for Microsoft. And I'm not trying to argue that I was as smart as Bill Gates or I could have pulled off anywhere near what Bill Gates did or that Intel could have done what Microsoft did. But had we let that operating system go in the public domain, IBM might not have had a need to buy it from Microsoft and the shape of the industry might have been very different and Intel's future might have been very different. So I always considered one of the mistakes I made was to keep ISIS proprietary because... Uh, was there anybody who fiercely opposed it at the executive staff level? I don't, I, I mean, I think we made that decision at yeah, it, was, it was never kicked up for that for discussion. I mean, I, we didn't. I mean, we didn't know what was going on. I mean, we were busy selling development systems, and I, I don't think we understood. I mean, the home PC. Nobody had I, any idea what you were going to do with a PC. I mean, uh, uh, you know, at the time all of this was going on, uh, I, I, I don't know when, when uh, I, I want to say Excel, but. Uh, what with the first spreadsheet was um, um, introduced? Um, load, um, Not Lotus, but uh, anyhow. Yeah, one, we, we, uh, we both know what you're talking about. But, but uh, I mean, you know, you know, it, 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 you know the, the we were working with IBM for a long time, and they were using Intel microprocessors and word processing equipment. I mean, it, it was, I mean, the, the whole PC thing just sort of arrived and, uh, uh, you know, people would talk about home PCs and, you know, what were people going to do with them and housewives were going to keep recipes in them, on them. And, uh, I mean, it was just, uh, nobody had any concept of what this was going to come out as. So. So at what point did Intel reorganize and go into business units? I, I don't remember, Rosemary. 
I, I think by the time I got there, which was 78. I was going to, the number I would have picked was 78. I, and I think that had just, because Les had just gone to st strategic staff. It could well be. That's what I, th I think, so, okay. So we are now at kind of the 78 time frame, yeah. and you are doing what? Still development systems, or have I, you? I, I, I was doing development uh, systems, and. Well, then when did you? Uh, well, and I, I don't, not quite sure of the year that Crush occurred. 80, your book 80, says. 80 was the year that Crush occurred, because I remember getting this telegram from Don Buckout from the eastern region telling us that we were getting our heads. Used to be an Intel sales guy. Yeah. Uh, Casey Powell was back there and and that we were getting our heads kicked in by Motorola. And I went into the executive staff meeting and said, you know, we're losing all these designs to Motorola and you guys who are marketing the microprocessors are a bunch of wimps. And uh, if, if you don't keep getting designs, my business is going to go to hell. And Andy looked at me and he said, you fix the problem. And uh, that was when Crush started. And that was when everything I learned at HP uh, and what we did was, you know, based on a lot of that stuff. I mean, not based on you know, the, the specific mechanics we used at HP, but based on the fact that, that the 8086 is not as good as the 68,000, but uh, we can create a device that is much more usable to the customer because the customer had to get something into production. He had to write software. He had tremendous design risk if the project was late. And we had all these peripheral circuits that he could use with the device that would reduce his, his cost of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the end system. And so, uh, we came up with the concept that the microprocessor you choose is the most important corporate technical decision you're going to make for the next decade. And we would then go in and explain this. Who was we? Well, uh, who it, was the who, what was who were the people on the Crush team? I, I don't rem remember all of them. Uh, Jim Lally was there. Um, I, I'm not sure who else was there. Uh, well, Regis was there because I asked Regis to uh, to uh, to join the crush Regis team. Regis himself, not some of his... It was Regis himself that I, I asked to join it. And I, Regis and I will disagree as to whether Andy asked him to do that and start crush or whether I did, but uh, I, 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 I did. I doubt, I don't doubt that. So. But anyhow, that uh, and I, I know it was I know it was Jim Lally and and Regis and myself and I don't know who else, but we got everybody supporting us and and uh, I mean it, it, I wrote about that in the book and and it, it probably describes it as it, better than I can do from memory now. Um. T talk a, bit, a little bit about the importance of Crush to Intel at that point in its history, and what was the impact of Crush or the Crush program at that? Well, point? I mean, uh, you know, ultimately, we won the IBM PC account, and um, uh, people will tell you. I remember talking to Colin Crook, who was the head of marketing at Motorola that it had nothing to do with Crush. Uh, you know, it, 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 the success of Intel and the PC business had everything to do with winning the IBM account and you could forget about everything else. And I think that, you know, you'll, we'll probably never know the whole story about how it happened, but uh, we, 
we really unleashed an assault on the market. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I mean, if you look at it today, Intel is effectively out of the memory business, and they would have been out of the memory business whether they had a microprocessor or not. And so winning the microprocessor was important to its corporate survival or its corporate success. And so uh, I, I, the fact that Crush worked, um, uh, I think was uh, key in making Intel, what, a $40 billion company. Had Crush not worked, Intel would probably be um, well, I, I, from my own perspective, as being in corporate marketing at that time, uh, working for Boucher, it galvanized that organization, and everybody knew what they were doing relative to Crush. Mm -hmm. It was an absolute priority, and I think that was probably true out in the product groups and oh, it was ar across because, the company. Uh, because, I mean, the great thing about Crush was that Noyce bought into it, and Grove brought into it, and everybody knew that that Grove wanted it done. And so any place you go, people would say, you know, we're gonna help. And I was in, my job was basically a staff job at that time. And I mean, I, I think I was still running the microprocessor um, development system division, but I was getting, I was working with all of these other people, you know, the EEPROM people, the this, that, and the other thing, and everybody was committing to making the program a success. And so, uh, and, and Andy was supporting it. I mean, had Andy not been supporting it, it would have been an absolute disaster. And I think House was working for Karsten that time, if I'm not mistaken. And, and, and so Jack would have had the microprocessor? Group? I think Jack had the microprocessors, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what do you think the biggest lesson that you had to teach, and I'm thinking uh, about uh, selling a dog uh, and the HP, was that the biggest lesson you had to teach the Intel organization? Well. Or get, I, get buy into, or it, 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 I think the problem is that that everybody, you know, wants to hold up a up a sheet of paper and say this spec, this spec, this spec, this spec, and if my specs are better than your specs, I've got a better product and I ought to win, and um, you know. Uh, I, I, I guess the maybe um, one way to think about that is suppose that 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 you buy a Mercedes and I buy a Ferrari, and if you look at it spec for spec for spec, the Ferrari is going to be better. And then I say to you, do you want to drive your car? anywhere and you say yeah and I say, how would you like to get it fixed if it breaks down and you'd say oh I really would like to get my car fixed and then I say well do you really want to own a Ferrari because you can't get your Ferrari fixed if you're up at Tahoe or in can't Neva even drive to Tahoe. Nevada <laughs> or something like this and I think it, 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 it's hard for people to realize that that there are a lot of things that make a product great rather than just the basic specifications. And, um, you know, it, one of the things I, I learned from somebody who was selling for IBM, I said, you know, well, this was my friend Bill Kramer. I said, what do you do when you go in and your computer is slower and more expensive, et cetera, et cetera? So he said, I just look the customer in the eye and say, if you buy from that guy, you won't get me. And, and I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, I'm going to make sure you succeed. And uh, so uh, the idea was to say, hey, if you buy the microprocessor from us, you know, 
we're going to ship them to you. We've got a fab area that's reliable. You know, what if you buy from this other guy and he, he doesn't know how to make MOS and this and that and the other thing. And you've got a development team and it may take you one year to design this or it may take you five years to design it. With our help, you're going to get it done in one year. With somebody else's help, it may take you three. So what's that worth to you? And so this is really a big shift, mindset shift in micro or in semiconductor marketing, microprocessor marketing. Well, I, 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 I mean, because the whole company was focused on benchmarks and all that kind. Well, of you know, and we wanted benchmarks too, but, but that was only one thing. Though. Yeah, but but the but the whole idea was that you know everybody uses the word solution. They say, oh, we're going to go out and sell solutions. Well, that's absolutely great. But it's one thing to say I'm going to sell you a solution. And it's another thing for me to uh, make it so that you can buy a solution. And, uh, you know, the words, I, I'm selling solutions, well, marketing people tell you to say that or advertising people tell you to say that. But the difference between selling somebody a solution and saying, I have a solution, is, is very different. And so suddenly you need training programs, you need application engineers, you need software, you need development aids, you need a reliable manufacturing area, you need documentation, you need this, you need that. And <coughs> the person with the best specs goes in and says, I've got the best specs. And it's a matter of training the field sales force to say, well, you know, it, it, does he have this? And, you know, what does this mean to you? And how long is it going to take you to program it if that happens? And, and <coughs> you know, so. So was, was the crush responsibility the what got you into, I, I think you were VP of corporate marketing. And sales, ultimately, yeah. Marketing yeah. and sales. Oh. Uh, was that the, the kind of the stepping stone to it? Or Well, I, I went in sometime after Crush, and uh, Andy and I had, had a little disagreement. And I went in and I talked with Andy, and no. That wasn't, no, that, that's wrong sequence. I, somehow I got in a discussion with Andy, and he said to me, you know, you're an average general manager. And I said, what does that mean? He said, well, he said, you know, you can always be a general manager for me, but you're average, basically. But, and if I ask you a question about operations, you say, I'll get back to you. And a week later, you come back to me, and you've made the right decision. He said, we're talking about marketing, and I say something to you, and you say, this is what, um, we should do. And I know what provoked the discussion because I, I was thinking about going into venture capital because I had a job offer for Kleiner Perkins. And, um, and uh, he said, you know, you'd be much happier working here if you were just doing marketing. And I said, you know, you're right and I'll just do marketing. And uh, that discussion really defined the rest of my career for me. I was, I'm going to say, roughly 45 years old at the time. And um, what, what that really taught me was to do the best at what you are best at. And since that time in my career, and I've learned that I was a lot better general manager than Andy gave me credit for because I've observed a lot of general managers and presidents. but. Be that as it may, um, the world perceived of me as the marketing person, and that I could make my best contributions to business, and for that matter, philanthropic institutions, by just saying, I'm going to help you with your marketing problems. And so, what I did. Uh, when I left Intel to position myself in venture capital was I wrote a book on marketing because everybody who wanted to talk to me about being involved in their ventures wanted me to talk to me because I had marketing sense. And then as I've gotten involved in philanthropic things, 
I, I basically said, you know, I'll work with you on your marketing issues. And uh, uh, so that's what I do. Um, what, what do you think your impact looking back on your, how many years total at Intel? Uh, it was basically 11. Okay. Or uh, looking back over that, those 11 years, what would you say where you had the biggest impact? And maybe you've already given me the answer, but I would want to ask the question. Well, everybody, I mean, I think everybody says it was the marketing of things. I, I always, that, that's the way I think that the organization saw you, certainly. Yeah, that's, that, yeah. that was how I was perceived of. Yeah. Uh, because Intel trans transformed itself, maybe that's too strong a, a verb, but certainly there was a big shift in the way, thinking about Slurp when, when I first got there, it, how they talked about the customer and solving customer problem, meeting customer needs, as opposed to seeing everything through the lens of what cool thing can we do. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I affected that that much, but... but uh -huh. Well, well if you didn't, who would you say did? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think these things happen, and and uh, I I think I guess at least as far as computation devices go, whether it was the presentation on selling a dog or Operation Crush, what. I convinced them of was that it was something about something more than the spec sheet, and that uh, that I demonstrated. But uh, uh, what effect that had ultimately on the corporate culture? I mean, you know. Okay, you're going to be modest. That's no, okay. no, I, 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 I don't. I mean, I, I don't know how things like that happen. You know, I mean, there, there are certain things. You say, crush would have never happened without me. I know that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm having a big impact on the development function at Caltech right now. And I, I head the development committee. And I've, I've worked on that problem for 13 years. And I know that I will have impacted that dramatically. Now, there are going to be other fallouts that are going to occur as a result of that. But I don't know that I'm necessarily, I mean, it, it, what will have gone on in development will be a piece of these other things, so. Um, what about Regis McKenna's role? You mentioned him earlier in Intel's marketing um, evolution, or the evolution of Intel marketing, I guess, is a better well, I way. Think, I think Regis is, you know, one of the best, um, Promotional minds, uh, and uh, I, I, I would like to distinguish that. And this is not to take anything from Regis, but as opposed to marketing, because Regis was really great at articulating positioning and coming up with ways to promote yourself within the industry and to network and to get recognition and what have you. And, um, and, and, and Regis had an immense influence that way. He was really good at that. Uh, it, 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 that to me is one component of, of, uh, of marketing, and I don't think there was anybody who was better at what Regis did than Regis. Uh, what would be the other components of marketing you think that the, the Regis himself as well as the organization were not as competent at? Well, I mean, to me, and I was, I was talking to somebody about this the other night at dinner who was doing music to go with ads, and I was saying, look, I mean, Marketing is about strategy, it's about positioning, <laughs> but it does no good to have the position thing all outlined if it doesn't line up with the customer base you're trying to serve. And in fact, 
if you can't align the mark, the organization behind the marketing, it doesn't work. And I think what marketing is about is, is getting all of the pieces defined and working together so that they can have that impact. And so what Crush was about was defining a message and having a promotional scheme. But then there were all these mechanics that went behind it of what products you design, what documentation you needed, what training you needed, um, how you trained the field sales force, how you motivated the field sales force. And it was getting all of those pieces to mesh that made Crush a success. And uh, I, I, uh, gosh, the guy who did the, the uh, fundamental book on product positioning, forget what his name is, but I, I met with him back in New York, and he, uh, he was saying that Xerox, I think it was, or something should become the document processing company or something. And that, if they just promoted themselves that way, uh, they would be great. And, and uh, it was Jack Trout. I think, or it was either Trout or Al Reese. I forget which one. I think I met with Trout. And I was thinking, or maybe, maybe he said that to me about Wang. May, I think it was about Wang. And I was thinking, you don't understand. Uh, and it, it, it's not that he, his, his idea was perfect. His idea was perfect. The problem was that it was, you know, varnish on a rotting hull. And, and unless, unless all the pieces support that message, you're never going to be able to promote the message. And the problem was he came up with a storyline, great storyline. What role does, does the fact that both Regis and uh, both Trout and Reese, to my knowledge, never have been inside a company running, you know, really understanding from a visceral, at a visceral level, level what it means to make a decision like that and execute against it. Well, I mean, I think that's the same problem that McKinsey has. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it's like, it's great to come up with a corporate strategy or a financial analyst. I mean, I, you look at these things and I know you watch and you're in the management of a company and somebody says, you dumb guys, if you only did this, wouldn't that be great? And you're sitting on the inside and saying, boy, I'd love to do that. Here's what it takes to do that. And you start adding up the bill and I was involved in a, with a discussion today. And, you know, we were talking about the solution of a problem for a particular company. And the problem is, it, it's clear the thing you'd like to do. The, the, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, me telling you, look at, you really ought to win Wimbledon, and all you need to do is improve your backhand, your forehand, and, you know, get a little more stamina and this and that and the other thing. I, but, Lose about 40 years. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I, and I, you know, I'd really love to win Wimbledon. But my back end isn't that good, and I've worked on it. But and and so you say, well, if I can't win Wimbledon, you know, maybe I ought to just win a match at the tennis club I play at, you know, and 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 I, I better play in a different league. And it it it, it it's it's um, um, so. Uh, well, let's let's go on to your decision to leave Intel. What mm -hmm. what? generated that decision? Well, uh, I, I was 50, and I thought, you know, do I want to spend the next 15 years at Intel? And I, uh, there were a lot of young people who I thought uh, probably should have my job, and, you know, Intel was a billion and a half dollar company, and I thought, what am I going to do at Intel for the next 15 years? if 
if I had been smart enough to know that Intel might become a $40 billion company, I would have said, well, there have been a lot for me to do, but I, I didn't have that vision at that time. And I had always said, I had had a, I had a plan where I was going to get educated for the first 25 years of my life, and I got educated for 26, and then I was going to work in industry for 25 years, then I was going to do venture capital for the next 25. And I didn't want to get into venture capital when I was too young. And um, so I decided I wanted to get into venture capital. What did you do? How did you go about that? Well, I... And how, how, at what point did you make that dis decision vis-a-vis -vis the point at which you actually exited Intel and... Well, a, a, a disagreement that Andy and I had w was the thing that that caused me to make the decision at the time. I had been working on building those relationships with venture capitalists for 15 years. So I had everything lined up so that I could do it. And, uh, and I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I had been doing due diligence for them. I had been serving on boards. I had made venture investments on my own prior to that. and. Um, uh, so, uh, I had everything lined up, and uh, Andy and I had this disagreement. What was the disagreement about? Oh, he wanted me to do something. I, I, I forget what the specific thing was, and I really didn't want to do it. Mm. I went into him after the executive staff meeting, and I said, Andy, uh, you know, if I continue to work for you, I've got a great deal of respect for you, but I'm going to end up having no respect for you, and I guarantee you, you will have no respect for me. And he said, you're right. And um, I said, I think I ought to leave. And he said, you're right. And um, that was, I think, in February. And he said, I'm going to make some of these management transitions. Will you stay around while I do it? And I said, sure, I'll help you through them. And, uh, and I, I guess in about October of that year, Andy and I were talking one day, and he said, you know, I really want to, I really appreciate how hard you've worked and what you've accomplished in this time. And he said, I, basically, he said to me, I never thought you would have attacked this with this dedication that you did. And by that time, Andy and I were getting along fine, so, but the die was cast. And so I went off to do venture. Okay, how did you get to be more David Alventure instead of a venture partner at, say, Kleiner Perkins or something? Well, I, I, I had talked with Kleiner Perkins about that, and I had talked with Sequoia about that, and I had talked with other people about that. And then Larry came along. Art Rock introduced Larry and myself, and Larry had this small venture, and he said, why don't you come in and be my partner? And I, I said, fine. And, uh, I, what was I, appealing to that as opposed to going into an established uh, firm? Well, uh, the, I, I just, you know, the, these firms have very strong cultures, and, and uh, so, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I had almost started a venture front with Kleiner, with Tom Perkins when I was at HP. And had it been, you know, Tom and myself, or two or three people, it would have been one thing. But trying to figure out how all the relationships work and what have you, and I, I just decided to be better off doing it on my own. So, what was the focus of more David Al in terms well, of investments? I, I did a lot of in terms of positioning. In terms of positioning, well. Uh, you know, Larry was doing, you know, mostly medical devices and medical things, and I was doing semiconductors and some software. And then as we hired other people, we, we did more um, information processing things and networking. <coughs> and I, I continued to do, you know, mostly semiconductor things. Although I did some th software what things. The, what are the key differences? Not what were, but what are the key differences between working inside a venture firm and working inside a uh, an industry company? Well, um, I mean, I'm sure it's different in every venture firm. But number one, 
um, I, I think in venture firms, you're a bunch of individuals, um, and you generate your own deal flow, and you look after your own companies, and there is teamwork, but it's, you're, you're, you're a bunch of individual contributors. Um, and I, I mean, you know, I mean, I've got my five deals, you've got your five deals, and and you make yours successful, and I'll make mine successful. And uh, I, it, it, and so, I think it's it's uh, venture firms tend to be uh, groups of Texas Rangers, you know, and uh, one Ranger, one Riot. What well, what. Uh what lessons that you learned during your years in industry carried forward uh, into and added to your ability to be a good VC? Well, uh, I think I knew how to operate things and knew how to help teach people to operate things. And, uh, and I understood what it took to run a business and I think that a lot of what goes on in venture capital today, especially during the, this bubble where too much money was raised and this and that and the other thing, was that you know, a lot of people uh, got involved in venture who were very smart and who had no practical experience. And because they thought they were smart, they thought they knew how to fix problems and manage things and do things and um, I, I, I th and I, I also uh, realized that being a venture capitalist is a staff position uh, I mean you're you're trying to get people to do things uh, but you don't have a lot of direct authority I mean you can fire them ultimately but that's a very tough thing to do you can't do it too often so you really have to earn people's respect and get them to want to do things that they should do. Uh, and a lot of it, a lot of people think that because they give people money, they can order them to do things, and it doesn't work too well. So, What about, you mentioned the bubble where there was uh, too much money, too few good deals. Um, what about the bubble, the dot-com bubble? What was the imp impact there from your perspective? Well, I, I, I stopped making um, um, new investments about two years before the top of the bubble. And um, I, uh, I, I really had a tough time with the entrepreneurs uh, because a lot of them weren't my kind of entrepreneurs. Um, they would... Uh, they would come in and say, we want to be serial entrepreneurs. And I would say, well, that, what does that mean? Well, I'll work for this company for two or three years, and I'll get it started, and then I'll go off and do another one. And I would say, who's going to do the hard work? And, um, and uh, they, they were you know, getting paid phenomenal amounts of money or valuations for ideas, and I can remember Dave Packard always saying, good ideas are a dime a dozen, and uh, he was interested in people who could implement them and get stuff done. And I felt that venture capital, and then one of the things that Tom Perkins had told me was that one of the keys to his success was to get the risks out early, and what he meant is spend a little money, get the risk out of the operation, and then really pour money in. And um, the money was going in, big amounts of money were going in before people had gotten the risks out early. And so I, I just felt uh, um, that there were a lot of things that were going wrong with the venture business at that time. What were the key lessons that were learned or identified, because some of them probably haven't been learned fully yet, but what were the key things that came out of the, the bubble in 2001, 2000, 2001 time frame um, that you think of people have internalized? Well, I think people learned that they paid too much for, uh, for concepts. And, uh, 
but we've been doing that since the South Sea bubble. So, uh, it, it, you know, that was just, a we just learned that lesson over again. Jim Morgan got, or a group of us got involved in joint venture Silicon Valley, and one of the things we were going to do is try to wire the valley. And um, we created, and I ended up running or being a motivating force between something that was called Smart Valley, I think, where we, uh, and uh, was myself and Bill Miller, and uh, we, we, we got a lot of people involved in trying to get the valley networked. And then a lot of other people got involved in that. That was how I met Marty. Uh, but uh, I, I'm trying to think of, of everybody we got involved, but we had a number of dinners and, and you know, out of that came the idea of wiring the schools and, and what have you. But I, I, I was pretty inactive. I, I was sort of part of the, the initial spark plug and then uh, we got John Young involved in it, as I remember, and Eric Bienemieu. And um, uh, so probably those people have uh, a more, a, a more in-depth knowledge of what was going on. To loop back um, to the uh, questions about the lessons learned from the bubble burst, uh, you said that MDV didn't really invest that many. Didn't I said I didn't. You personally didn't, okay. Um, you personally did not make that many internet or e-commerce commerce oriented uh, investments. But what is your observation in terms of the, the VCs, either in your firm or others, who made some of those early investments and um, what kind of, how did that turn out overall? Well, I, I think there were some, some great investments made. I mean, you know, I, I mean, how can you, I mean, Amazon, uh, things like that. I, I invested in a company called Viant, which was an internet services company. And our sales, you know, just ramped and ramped and ramped. And uh, as a result of the internet bubble, we had everybody who wanted to bring up a website. And, you know, we were helping them integrate that with their business and what have you. When the bubble burst, well, we got the company public, and I think we made 50 times our money on the investment, and then the bubble burst and all the business evaporated. And uh, so that was a company that had a real business that was generating lots of revenue during the bubble, but when suddenly Ford and American Express said, hey, it's not as urgent that we have all this capability instantly, then you know a lot of our business went away. Uh, in order to wrap up a little bit here, let's go back and look and kind of take an overview looking back. What are, what were the things that you were associated with in your career that you you were the most pleased with, the most proud of, the most most rewarding to you? Well, uh, you know, I was I obviously was very pleased with what the way Intel worked out and the role I played there. Um, I mean, I think I've had some pretty good venture deals. One of the most recent ones was Rambus, which... They just had a nice... Yeah, and, and uh, I think that's going to prove to be a vindication of some... some uh, uh, of IP as a business model. Well, yeah. I mean, it was here was an industry that that wasn't inventing, and we and we could not get in as a country. We could not form a dynamic RAM business and make it viable. And so we said, hey, if the Japanese and the Koreans have driven us out of that business, we can still invent something, and we did. And uh, and uh, it. The invention was so valuable that they formed a cartel to drive us out of the business. And what? But it, it's taken us 20 years, right? I, I was chairman of the board for 15 years, and um, I'm not going to argue we did everything right because if we had done everything right, we would have had less problems. But um, it, 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 I think we made a tremendous contribution to the industry, and it was a. It was a big risk on that business model because, 
uh, uh, sort of nobody had ever tried something like that. Uh, you could say Qualcomm did, but I don't think Qualcomm got there quite the same way we did. I, I mean, this was, we aren't going to have any products at all, but what we are going to do is invent and license. And that was something that had been going on in the pharmaceutical industry, but nobody had really tried it in the, in the uh, semiconductor industry. And uh, so uh, I'm... Would you say that Rambus is your biggest investment success? Well, no. I think I, I made I made in my career about 25 investments, and uh, I only invested around 25. No, I invested around 75 million dollars, and I returned 750 million. So, so, uh, uh, and and five of them did better than 10 to one, uh, of which. Rambus was one, and Viant was one, and I'm not, I could go through, I've got a list of them at home, but um, uh, of the ones that did that, uh, you know, I, and I, I'd have to look at the list to tell you, so. Is there anything that I should have asked you about your career, your life, that I haven't asked you that you would like to make sure gets captured for posterity? My wife is great. <laughs> and so are my kids. <laughs> All right, that's wonderful. All right, one last question. This leads back to the discussion that you and John and I were having over lunch. Why do you think having a computer history museum is, you understand this is to be, um, why is that important to the semiconductor industry, to the computing industry? Well, all right. Our history is an integral part of our future, and it shapes our future. And I mean, if you don't believe that, all you have to do is look at all the different cultures around the world and and see how what has happened before uh, determines a lot about what is going to transpire in the future. It's it's history sets you on a path, and. Um, I, I was talking to John about this because I'm, I'm deeply involved in Caltech, and and I've tried to understand why I should be deeply involved in Caltech. And finally, what I concluded was that it was really important to the country to have these beacons of technological achievement because ultimately those would inspire the next level down and the next level down and the next level down. And I, I, I think, and I don't know quite how the message for the Computer History Museum should be articulated or how it's articulated, but to have a beacon uh, for the level of achievement that has gone on in the valley in this area is important because it will inspire achievement in other areas, but it will also preserve the legacy of this achievement and motivate other people to do the next thing. And so I, I, I think you've got to think of it in, in, in those terms because uh, if, if the message is preserving the past, I think that's, that's important, but it's the implications of preserving the past that are really important so that uh, a lot of the vitality of the valley is going to come from extending these achievements and letting people know that and have some perspective on how those things happened is, is really important. Bill, you've written three books. Uh, what drove you or what was the inspiration to write the books, one and two? What were the key things you learned in writing them? Okay, so when I was getting in the venture business, I said the only reason I needed a brand. And I said everybody knew me as the marketing person and so I will establish my brand by writing a book on high-tech marketing. In that book on high-tech marketing, there was a chapter on why companies give bad service. 
And after that book came out, I realized that the chapter was very incomplete. And there was a service boom going on. And I thought, gee, I can get more flow of business. And I understand a lot about service, so I'll write a book on service. So I wrote the book Total Customer Service. And then I began understanding the implications of service and the virtual economy. And I had given talks on this, on virtual products. And, um, and I was talking one day with Mike Malone, and I said, here, I've got this speech. Why don't you turn it into a book? And he said, I think we ought to write a book on this. And so that led to us writing the book about the virtual corporation, which um, when it first came out, I thought maybe we've overstated our case. And then within about three years, I realized we had understated it. And um, so, uh, and I'm working on another book now, which I hope is going to be out this fall, on how the internet is affecting the structure of society. And um, it actually would be an interesting thing for the Computer History Museum to think about because the argument is that what you are connected to is your environment. And if you change connections abruptly, you go through abrupt environmental change. And this looks at the adjustment process of, uh, of what is happening and what you must do to adjust. And uh, so uh, I hope that will get done. All right, and then how, how did the book writing exercises affect your, the rest of your business life? Mm -hmm. In other words, what, what did you get out of them that there was some dynamic exchange between well, that uh, experience and the, your other experiences? There, there, there's obviously been business flow that's come out of them. Uh, but it, it, one of the nice things is that a lot of people, if books are good, read them, and then you get a chance to engage with a lot of people. And so it's enriched my life in that respect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. This Thank was great.